We're going to sing number 447, 447. This is one we used to sing at camp a lot. Let's stand as we sing 447. Freely, freely, for those of you who know it. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said freely, freely, you have been seen. Freely, freely give. Go in my name and you believe. Others will know. name in earth and heaven in Jesus name and in Jesus name I come to you to share his power as he told me to he said free turn now while you're standing to 555 555 drew may be a preacher one of these days he's got the, the lungs for it 555 i hope i'm not just blaring everybody on zoom out with this mic right in my mouth let's hope not With sweet accord, join in a song with sweet accord. Thus around the throne, and thus around the throne, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly fields, before we reach the heavenly fields, walk the golden streets, or walk the golden streets. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Beautiful 
city of God. Thank you. Let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the beauty of that song and the idea. And I believe it comes from probably the, the idea of this, one of the psalms that we're going to look at today, uh, the psalms of steps, as the Bible says, of, of uh, as we're going on a journey up to be in God's house, that we may hear and receive the good that comes as we go to hear from you. Thank you, Father, for the journey that's been made this morning by those who physically came. Thank you for the commitment of those who, although they are protecting themselves, uh, their health, or they can't come for another reason, they're here by Zoom. Those that are going to listen later on the, the recording, we just thank you for the journey uh, that we're making, that we can know you and celebrate you together. We pray that you'd bless this time. We know apart from your Holy Spirit, it's impossible that this be any good or worth anything. Uh, they, the Bible will be just words on the page without your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we ask that you come. We need you. We ask that you would come not just in this hour, but we need you every hour. Uh, you are precious to us. And we pray that you would use this time to support our faith, to strengthen our faith, to help us as we come together in a time where our faith is being beat upon uh, out there in the world, that we come together to say, I too believe with you. And we find strength from one another. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. you. may be seated. I know we have announcements. I was kind of hoping Andrew would be here. I know that uh, he is getting in a lot of flying hours at work because I feel like this is one of the reasons. He's knowing that his dad is uh, critically ill. He's going to, just from an earthly standpoint, he won't be here, uh, as the doctor said. He won't be here Wednesday, or as the nurse said, that's staying with him. That's their professional opinion. And so I know Andrew's getting ready to spend some time with his family. And so uh, pray for pray for Andrew's dad. Spent some good time with him not long ago. I know Andrew has too. Uh, pray for these grandkids of his. I told Dave, I said, we share some very precious things together. We have some very precious grandchildren that we share. And of course, we talked about a lot of other things. I apologize that he has to put up with that daughter-in-law, but other than that, we're, we're doing okay. <laughs> We have a lot of announcements. The reason I went into Andrew, I didn't plan on saying all that, because Andrew's very good at detail and, and making good notes and all that. We had a board meeting and we decided <coughs> we're going into phase two of our regathering. And phase two is going to include adult only Sunday school next Sunday. It'll begin and it's going to be in here. And uh, by saying adult Sunday school class, I know that's rough on the ones with children, that if you're going to try to come, it's going to be hard if we're not having classes for them. But right now, that's what we're doing. We're going to watch and see how school goes and some of those things, as some of the board members wanted us to go slowly, especially exposing our Sunday school teachers to uh, uh, the virus. And, and so that's the way we're going to proceed. But I want you to know that if you're willing to brave it, you can bring your kids into my class. And so we're going to have adult Sunday school class here. I will be far less formal. I'm going to probably sit down there with you guys, and you're going to spread out however much you need to. Uh, the blessing upon coffee with certain guidelines has been given. And so uh, it, may, it may have to be served to you, and you may have some of the things you like to put in your coffee laid out in separate uh, piles. I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but we're making progress. And then Wednesday night youth uh, is going to start again, but I believe it's after Labor Day, if, if Valerie know that. There is going to be a youth retreat, as far as we know. Uh, all systems are still go on that uh, Labor Day weekend. And thanks to some of the ladies in the church, they volunteered to cook. I know you accept men's help too. 
those who aren't worried about their safety, you'll be wearing masks when you serve the kids and all that, but we appreciate your willingness to serve and pray that God would protect that endeavor. We didn't have church camp except online and we're going to attempt to have, and our retreats tend to be small, so it's a good, good place to start and do some of the social distancing and some of those things. Uh, don't let your kids go to this retreat unless you're okay with it because we know life carries with it risk. Uh, we have, uh, we, when we came this morning, we took a risk and we got in our cars because we never know what's gonna happen out there on the highways. Life involves risk and we have to be aware of that. And we have to say risk and reward and we have to balance those, don't we? Everybody does that differently. And so we, we want to uh, do that. We want you to be comfortable. Do not send a young person if you're not comfortable with it. Do not come and volunteer if you're not comfortable with it. And if there, at any time you do volunteer and you're uncomfortable with the situation, be sure and let us know. We're going to do everything we can to make it uh, best for everybody. So the most important thing you can do is pray because we want God's protection over our church, over our youth. They're going back to school. My wife uh, is a teacher. She's retired five years from uh, public school, but she's going to be teaching two days a week at Bracken Christian this school year. So this is a grand experiment, isn't it? We're all going to be back in school. And so pray for their protection as everybody goes back. Are there other announcements? Lorna. Ladies, arts and crafts are scheduled to meet on October 7th. Again. Okay. That was another one of those things, if they could uh, do social distancing and some of those things that the ladies could start meeting again. So we're thankful for that. Pastor, I sent Eli out to all the ladies of the church for little Alex's bridal show. Yeah. Shower and it's going to be October fourth, Sunday, right after church. It's okay. Luncheon and we're going to shower her with gifts before her wedding in November. October the fourth. That date kind of rings a bell with me for yeah. some reason. <laughs> uh, Tuesday rings a bell with me too. I'll get you in a second, Pam. Tuesday is uh, our wedding anniversary. We will have been married forty-two years this Tuesday, so we're we're excited about that. Thankful to God. All right. <laughs> August the 18th is your birthday. Wow. That's awesome. Pam. So let's do a movie night. Okay. All right. So we picked uh, September 11th. Uh, I realize that is 9 11, but what a great way to be celebrating our country by being in church mm -hmm. and enjoying a good movie. We're going to do hot dogs and chips and all that. We'll make sure everything is safe. And um, we're not going to charge for movie night, but if you'd like to leave a donation, we'll have a little donation bucket out. But we're going to do hot dogs and chips and drinks and stuff. All right. The way we do movie night, everything's set out separately anyway, so it should work great for those, those who want to be safe. Uh, real quick, 5.30, and we'll be between 5.30 and 6, 6.15, and then we'll start the movie after that. All right, what we do is usually select a good Christian movie, whether we've, some of us may have seen it or not, but it's uh, always good to watch together. So looking forward to that. Any other announcements? All right, well, let's, uh, if you have a prayer need that you're, is on your heart right now, and you want specifically for us to pray for you, we invite you to stand. Uh, we try to publish the list uh, so that those who are on Zoom will know who stood during the service and others will know. Right, let's pray. Father, we believe in your power. We believe in your grace. Uh, we believe your word. When you have said, we have not because we ask not. And so those of us who believe you and believe in your power, uh, we come, the only way that we can come is through faith in the name of Jesus Christ. And we come to you in the, the name of Jesus and all that he's done and provided that we may come to the throne of grace. And we ask that you would intervene and meet with each individual who's standing and with the, the need that they have on their heart. 
we know that you're able to work and we know there are other wills involved uh, for you to do what some of us want done but boy you can bring the resources of heaven to bear on somebody's heart and life we've seen it and that's what we ask for if there's anyone standing for a spiritual need or a loved one or something like that father you can send the resources whether it's a stranger somebody that knows the lord that we don't know use whatever uh, tool or instrument you can to reach those and father we pray that you would be with every physical need every emotional need you know we ask that your will be done in jesus name we pray amen the rest of you can stand now to join them number 172 172 172 tell me the story of jesus tell me the story of jesus Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the high. Peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting. he was tempted yet was triumphant at last tell of the years of his labor tell of the sorrow he bore he was despised and afflicted homeless rejected and story of Jesus right on my heart every word tell me the story most precious sweetest that ever was heard tell of the cross where they nailed him standing for a moment I just thought of I was uh, watching a, a black minister Seventh-day Adventist happened to be but a black minister uh, uh, preach and talk about the black keys on the piano and he said did you know that most Negro spirituals are written with just the black keys on the piano he played several of them and then he said there was the first white song based on a negro spiritual and it was amazing grace 
And y'all know that uh, Amazing Grace was written by a former slave ship captain who came to Christ, repented of his sins, and knew how wrong all of that had been. And they say he wrote Amazing Grace to the tune of a, an African morning song expressing their grief and their sorrow. When I heard that, Amazing Grace, I've always loved it, but it took on even a more significant meaning to me. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. As we are reminded of all that Jesus went through and how he was rejected, and he was a man of sorrow, Sometimes that puts our suffering in perspective, doesn't it? We need to be reminded of those things. Uh, we're, this is the time we would normally take an offering, and again, plates are as you come and go. Thank you for supporting this work. Uh, John David was one of those who did a lot of the groundwork for us to be able to have online giving. And so we appreciate that, but I'd like to ask if you'd pray over the giving today. Father, thank you so much for, for everything come and, and be with your body for worship, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you pour out in the service for us. Fill us up, Lord, for everything you have Amen. for us. Uh, but in this time, Lord, just pause to consider giving, Lord. Let us think about what your word says, Father. That you tell us that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Yeah. Father, Lord, let us just meditate on that as we give, Father. Just knowing that if we pour ourselves out for you, Lord, it is more blessed than to just hold on to everything. Amen. Help us, Lord, give whatever means, whether online, whether by check, cash, whatever, of our time. Help Amen. us to give ourselves for you, to pick up our cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> stand for the doxology. seated. Charlie has agreed to have special music. I don't know what form that's taking, but I want you to come now.
Praise the Lord for His presence. Psalm 133. Psalm 133. It's a long psalm, three verses. If you'll notice it says, A song of degrees of David. And those words are inspired in Holy Scripture. It's not something your translators put in there. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment, his high priestly garment. As the dew of Hermon, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded, commanded the blessing. Life forevermore. That is the blessing. Life forevermore. One of the great tools of that blessing is this unity that this psalm is talking about. It's another song of degrees or steps which is a, a great revelation because the Psalms were the Old Testament hymn book. There was a section in the Old Testament hymn book that was for this specific thing. It was when they were leaving their homes and making their way up to Zion, to Jerusalem, uh, to worship together, to hear the word of the Lord, to make the sacrifice that symbolized the blood of Jesus. It's one of those uh, songs in that section, especially for a specific journey. I talked about this when we first came back into worship in May. I forget the exact date, but we'd been out for a few weeks. I think we were out eight weeks, if I recall. And this was one of the psalms that I brought because it used Psalm 122.1, the beginning of this series. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's one of those as they began to make their journey with God's people up to Jerusalem. They, they were excited. I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let us go where we learn more about God. Where our faith is su supported, as I said earlier, instead of attacked. The very first words of this section of hymns, Psalm 120 and verse 1. In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and He heard me. That's what they were singing when they started this journey. I cried unto the Lord and He heard me. Psalm 121.1 I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence my help cometh. And they were literally ascending a hill to Jerusalem. But it's certainly symbolic of the spiritual reality of God. I'll look up there where I find my help. It's not down here. It's up on the hill. My help comes from the Lord which made heaven and earth. When God's people left their homes, it was uphill to Zion, to Jerusalem, and there were those three main feasts. We reviewed some of those the last time. I'm going to give you just a quick snippet. Those symbolic uh, observances, part of their Bible that we talked about last week. God was giving them the Bible. God spoke through these events, that, and they're here for us to study because God included them in the inspired Bible that we have. Remember the Passover. They ate unleavened bread because when you go with God, there's no higher priority. You don't have time to let the bread rise. You got to go. When they left Egypt, they left on the, on the spot. They had to drop everything and go. Yeah, they gathered up a few other things, but the idea is you don't have time to let bread rise. We got to go. From then on, it was the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. It was the feast of the Passover and the Passover lamb. There isn't time. We have to give our all. And so God has used leaven as a symbol of sin. You've got to leave all and follow Him. God has used the, the leaven, the yeast in bread to symbolize uh, error in, in God's Word. And you allow error to come in and spread. We must confess, repent, and when we have embraced something false, we must let it go. And so a quick review of the three main feasts helps us to understand this unity in Psalm 133. 
The blood of the lamb was smeared on the doorpost and they were to abide under that blood and feed on that lamb. It's no accident that Jesus came at the time of the Passover when he gave himself as the lamb of God. The very time of Passover, Jesus, the lamb of God, showed up and he died for my sins and yours. Then the next major feast on the Jewish calendar was Pentecost. It commemorated the giving of God's law on Mount Sinai. When they had left Egypt, they had gone through the Red Sea, which symbolized the baptism of God's people. They came into that relationship with God, and He gave them His law, imparted to them His word. Then it was written in stone. But it represents the time when God would write it in our hearts, in a living relationship in the fleshly stones, the fleshy stones of our hearts. It represents the time when God writes it in our heart. The Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. How appropriate. Jesus came and gave His life on Pentecost. The Holy Spirit of God came as promised on the day of Pentecost. When the law would come and be written in our hearts. Then there was the Feast of the Tabernacles. That's the one I said when we came back into church, I think a lot of us would have liked you go camping. Some of us hate camping, but a lot of people, at least us guys, tend to like camping, right? They went into tents to remind them of the time when they wandered in the wilderness back in the past, but now they were enjoying the blessings of the promised land, so it was looking back and rejoicing in the present. Celebrated at the time of harvest, the time of completion. All that work had been done. They'd planted seeds, they'd watered, they'd weeded, they'd done everything for the harvest. And now the harvest had come in and God's people celebrated the harvest. It was the time of the fruit of, of the efforts being completed. They looked back and rejoiced and gave thanks. It was a time to break forth the palm branches and receive the victorious Lord. When the trumpet shall sound and time shall be no more, the Lord shall put in the sickle and receive the fruit of the earth. The last time we talked about this, I read Jeremiah 8.20, a sad verse. God doesn't want to be true of any of us. Jeremiah 8.20, the harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we're not saved. But Psalm 133 is about the joy of us knowing we are being saved by that relationship we have as we ascend the hill. How amazing it is and how it works to aid in the process, having others that go with us. This unity that we're in this together produces great joy. Psalm 133.1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, to be that family and to be after the same thing. What a blessing that is. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. This is when Moses had uh, ordained uh, him as the priest, Aaron as the priest. It was a symbol of the presence of God. They would add fragrant elements to that oil. And not only was the oil... Uh, life giving. Not only did the oil penetrate and represent the presence of God, it had a beautiful fragrance. And so, whenever an instrument of God was being anointed, there'd be that fragrance. God, through David, is saying, That's the way this unity is. It just spreads and you smell it. It's the anointing, it's the presence, it's the use of God. There's something in the air when this kind of unity is experienced. Not just the unity of the, of the Spirit that the Bible talks about, but the unity and moving towards the goal together. Paul in Philippians 3, beginning with verse 12, says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, and that word in the Greek means carried to the end, or brought to full completion, or finished, 
or brought to full accomplishment. He's saying, I haven't reached that place yet. God is accomplishing that in me. But he goes on to say, but I follow after. That's what I'm in pursuit of. By the grace of God, I am all in. I am fully cooperating with the grace of God by my faith. I'm all in, he said. Goes on to say in the words of Philippians 3, If that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. The reason he came to live in my heart, I want to attain that. I want to attain it. He came into my heart for a reason. I want to attain that reason. I am after what Jesus was after when he came to me. That's what I'm after. What did he want? What was he after? What did he want to accomplish? That's what I want accomplished in my life. I'm after what Jesus was after when he came to me. And listen, it wasn't over the day that we asked Jesus into our heart. It had only just begun. We had made a commitment for that to happen in our lives by his grace. God, through Paul, continues in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things that are behind, uh, and yes, we're not allowed past sins to be used against us, but this is more about understanding that the lessons of the past are to be stepping stones to the future. And so not just dwelling there, not staying there in the past, but moving on. Using that event and those times and those lessons to build and to progress. Ascend the mountain, the hill, to Jerusalem. Allowing God by His grace to carry us home. The rest of Philippians 3.13 says, Forgetting those things which are behind reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There is the highest calling ever. That's what I want. I want to be what He wanted me to be when He came to me. This one thing. It's an upward calling. We are called, those who have received Christ, to move up in that relationship to grow. And we have that wonderful unity as God's people. We're working our way up to Zion. By His Word, by faith, supporting each other in that. We're marching to Zion, the beautiful city of God. That's what church is all about. That's what Christian brotherhood is all about. It's not about anything else. It's not, not about us getting along. It's about us doing that together. And we put up with each other to do that. The church, the called out ones, ekklesia, the Greek word for the church, the called out ones. In order to be called up ones. And that is what Ephesians 4 says on the subject of unity. God, through Paul, calls God's people to walk worthy of their calling with lowliness and meekness, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Apostle Paul says that lowliness, meekness, it takes humility for us to be engaged in this process of all of us working for the goal. That's because we all have different personalities, don't we? We all are at different places in our lives. And some people look at other people and say, why haven't they made more progress? A lot of things have to be done sometimes in rooting out old stuff before building up can be accomplished. And so I'm not my brother's judge. God knows what they're dealing with down in the root system. God knows what we're dealing with in our root system, whether it's individuals or a church or somebody else. And, and we can't build until the roots are taken care of. And so we have to put up with each other. We have to maintain this unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace so that we can do something together. Those who have received the true Christ of Holy Scripture, they are in the family, and to deny that is wrong. I love celebrating the family of God 
whatever label they may have been raised with, whether, whether they're Baptist or whether they're Methodist or whether they're Pentecostal or, yeah, even Seventh-day Adventist, if they don't get too legalistic. Part of the family of God. We're called out together, but don't ignore the rest of Ephesians 4. I know we're not turning there, but later you can look it up. Ephesians 4, we maintain this unity of being called out in order to be instrumental in us moving up. Ephesians 4, 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith. That's God's truth, the word. When the definite article the is in front of faith, it's not us believing it, it's what we're believing. The faith, the truth. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, speaking the truth in love, may grow up into Him in all things. Psalm 133 again. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like that precious, precious anointing oil. It is the presence of God involved when we're doing that. God is present and working. That is God's stamp of approval. It's the spark of true worship. You wonder, what makes the difference? It's when the anointing is present. And I know we can get weird about the word anointing and it can become a mysterious thing. All it means is that God is there and working. God has selected and, and is moving and using a group of people or an individual. He's present and He's working. There's an old saying about the fly in the ointment. Have you all ever heard that old saying? Well, that's the fly in the ointment. Everything's going beautifully and great until this happens or this person comes or that happens. That's the fly in the ointment. Do you all know that comes from the Bible? Almost all those old sayings, somehow you can almost always find a root in Holy Scripture. Ecclesiastes 10.1, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor, the King James said, but a stinking smell. Here's this wonderful, anointing, health-giving, precious ointment, and if you get a fly in there, it can ruin the whole thing. It can make it all stink. The medicine of the presence of God's Holy Spirit becomes just the opposite of that when we make it about me instead of Him. It'll mess it up every time. Whether we're talking about the role of a priest in the Old Testament or the role of a local church or a group of churches or a larger body of Christ where this unity exists, there is blessing. But the moment it becomes about me, it'll mess up the whole ointment. Where we are in pursuit together of the knowledge of God and we want God's will to be done, there is this sweet anointing. The sweet anointing. When we as husband and wife are in it to grow in Christ together and to reflect the roles of Jesus Christ, there is an anointing, there is a fragrance that comes from that relationship that God uses. The moment it's about one of us or both of us, there is a fly in the ointment and there is a stench where there should be a great fragrance. The anointing. When we as parents are unified in making Christ known to our children, there is an anointing in the house. When they know it's not about mama and it's not about daddy, it's about God and what he wants. And we can express to our children, we are just weak human instruments. We make mistakes. We're on our way up that mountain. But as long as they know that you're truly in it for the Lord and not for yourself, there is a sweet aroma in that house. And I'd be the first to tell you, and I, he's in heaven now, he can't defend himself. My dad made a few mistakes. But I never had any doubt. He was in it for the Lord. And you can make a whole lot of mistakes as a parent. And if they know that you're in it for the Lord, there is a sweet fragrance of the presence of the Holy Spirit and His anointing. 
And we can forgive a lot if we know they really love us. If they really love the Lord, they really love us. Oil was vital to the people in biblical times. Olive oil uh, lit their lamps. It was their electricity. It healed their wounds. It had healing properties. It was mixed with herbs. As I said before, there was an aromatic uh, blend that was given. And the more aromatic, the more expensive it was, uh, the more uh, it was considered precious. It refreshed weary travelers. It was an extremely valuable product. It was what Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, used to anoint the feet of Jesus and to wipe his feet with her hair, if you'll remember. John 12, 3 says the house was filled with the odor of that ointment. I like the word fragrance better than odor. Cindy and I came in here this morning. We thought it smelled like maybe a mouse died in the wall somewhere. I hope y'all didn't smell that. We tried to spray. That's why I like the, the word fragrance better. The house was filled with the fragrance of that ointment. Do you remember what Jesus said when Judas complained and said that was wasteful? Besides, you'll always have the poor with you in some of those statements. He said in John 12, 7, Let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this, the, my burial. Mary Elizabeth Baxter, a Christian writer of the 1800s, wrote something. Mary had understood, this is what this Mary Baxter wrote in the 1800s. Mary had understood what none of the disciples had fully taken in, that Jesus must die for our sins. None but Jesus himself understood her action. He was the representative of men as the sin bearer. Mary anointed him for his burial. Jesus knew the motive which prompted her. What a contrast, she continues to write, what a contrast there is between the spirit of Martha and Mary. The one makes the house uncomfortable with her bustling self-importance. The others... Fill the house with the odor of the ointment, the fragrance of the ointment. The Mary spirit, which waits to, to do till she has learned the will of her master, is a blessed one in the house. There are some women's lives which have an atmosphere of heaven about them, which everybody feels unobtrusive, quiet, meek, no stir, seeming to do very little, and yet some way, Everything is done. There is nothing remarkable about their houses, yet everyone is at home there. There's nothing special about their conversation, but it helps those who hear it. It is the presence of the Master shining through them. No woman can make herself such as this. It is God only who can conform us to the image of His Son. But every Christian woman can yield herself to Him that the house where she dwells may be filled with the odor of the ointment with which she is anointing Jesus all day long with her actions as her king and as her priest. The one to whom she refers, the one whom she obeys, the one whom she honors. Most houses had the atmosphere either of Martha or Mary. Remember, this is a lady talking. Most houses had the atmosphere either of Martha or Mary. Some are full of hurry, pressure, bustle. Others full of rest and quiet power. The Lord raise up amongst us many a Mary who shall sit at His feet and be unto God a sweet savor of Christ. I say this is a woman writing that because I think maybe we need to say that to men more than we do to the women. Instead of seeking for ourselves in marriage, join together in seeking Him and making Him known. One of the first things I do when I have marriage counseling, and if a marriage seems to be on the rocks or having trouble, the first thing I do is go to the Bible and say, what was marriage designed to do and be? And do you want it to be and do that? If the answer to that is truly yes on both parts, then the marriage can be what God needs it to be. It may take work. It may not be easy. It's like I've said every time I talk about my now 42-year marriage to Cindy. Some people think, oh, they were just made for each other. And you've heard me say it before. You weren't there in the early days of our marriage. 
Everyone who has a happy marriage right now is kind of nodding at the moment. You weren't there. But when we did it for the Lord, and we did it because it was the right thing, instead of what I needed and what I wanted, the Holy Spirit blessed it. When two walk together because they are agree agreed and they are in pursuit of God together, there is a fragrance there. In Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered together, there he is. But there's something else that says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am. It harkens back to the Old Testament courtroom of seeking truth together. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am. When we talk about marriage, two shall become one. When we're in it together, any gathering, any discussion, any marriage, when God's truth and God's way is sought together, He is there. He's there. As always, I have a lot more I could share with you. But I'm not. Except to read Psalm 133 one more time. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for mom and dad to dwell together in unity. The Bible says don't change the word, so I hope you'll allow me to do that just for the sake of the message. How good and how pleasant it is for husband and wife together to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment when Aaron was anointed. That fragrance filled the whole house. As the dew of Hermon, those majestic mountains that have snow on them oftentimes in Jerusalem, that the fresh water descends upon Zion, the city of Jerusalem. It's like that. It's those refreshing springs from, from this mountain. It's where God commanded the blessing. Life forevermore. I want us to sing. Got to find out what number it is. Number 373, where he leads me. Number 373. Let's stand. 373. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear
Some of somebody messed up on that song. I don't know how y'all did it. Y'all know the refrain is at the bottom and you sing that every time. Does everyone know that? Just an illustration. We need a leader, don't we? <laughs> we need a leader. I am thankful to God when little ones are allowed to come, when the parents think they're ready and take communion, when the little ones come to the altar of prayer, because I don't remember when I started doing that. Growing up in a church where they had an altar call like we do here. I don't remember when I started it, but I'm thankful that I did. We have a lot of distractions, don't we? It's just like at home, <laughs> a lot of distractions. I tell you, if you're in it for the Lord, in the midst of all the trouble and the strain and the heartache and the difficulty, there'll be a sweet fragrance, God's Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for bringing us to this place. Thank you for your wonderful presence, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I think at times the church has made that some mysterious thing that is kind of hard to figure out. But we know, Father, it's your presence and you support your word and you support those who are committed to it. And there's a unity that says, yeah, we're all uh, in so many different places, but we got to stick together because we're ascending that hill together. And we're going to come to that place where Christ is formed in us. And we're going to live with you for all of eternity. And that fragrance, that joy will be there like never before. How we look forward to it. A Christian home is a glimpse of it when done right. And we pray for that, Father, in every home that's represented here and whatever means people are using to listen. Go with us. May this be a day of rest, a day of rejoicing that we've been in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.